Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. We set out to create an entertaining and exciting podcast about law and business. Black Letter, the name, comes from the Gothic typeset. Over time, Black Letter became the only font that English law books were printed in. It made it harder for kind of the common person to understand what the English law books said. Black Letter came to represent something that was law, that was set in stone, that was sort of old and a well-settled fundamental principle of law. We're here to demystify black letter law. We're here to demystify things that happen in business and law and where those two meet. And I hope you have fun listening. Hi, welcome back to another episode of the Black Letter Podcast. This week, I have with me Robert Greenspoon, an attorney with my firm, Dunlap, Bennett, and Ludwig. And I'm really excited about this podcast. We're doing it by video because we're going to have pictures of patents and some charts and statistics. It may sound boring. They go, Disraeli said there's lies, damnable lies, and statistics. But in this case, these are fun statistics. We're going to talk about how patents have shaped our society and how our society in turn has been shaped by patents, which, and the patents that Rob has chosen to use to talk about this are very relevant to current affairs. They're interesting, they're fun, the pictures are fun, and I hope you enjoy the show. Rob, thanks for joining us on the Black Letter Podcast this week. And, and before you say anything, guys, you wanna see Rob's face. You wanna watch this on video if you get a chance. I know you're probably listening, but the stuff we're gonna throw up on the screen is fun. And Rob's an animated visual speaker, here he is. And, uh, and we even changed our shirts so that we weren't wearing the exact same shirt when we came on the air because uh, we both had on the typical attorney blue shirts. Rob, thanks for joining the show. Well, Tom, thanks for having me, and and thanks for realizing that the most important thing in an audio podcast is to wear the right shirt. Uh, no, this is a video podcast, so we're, we hope that everybody tunes in and, wa and watches because it's going to be quite interesting. So a little bit about Rob. So Rob, University of Chicago, very well-known appellate lawyer, a patent prosecutor, and a patent litigator. So Rob, tell us, tell us what are we going to talk about today? Give me an overview. Yeah, well, today I decided to do a what I call a non-random, non-scientific sample of the history of invention from 100 years ago to the present. So really, like it's it. a fancy way of saying I picked three patents from 100 years ago and I picked three patents from today. And uh, I think we can use those as a springboard to talk about issues of, of uh, great importance to all of us. Fantastic, Rob. Well, where would you like to kick this conversation off? Tell me what you've got in your mind. Before we do, I, I just want to tell you something, Tom, a fact you may, you may not know about me. My undergraduate degree, yes, I completed a degree in physics at the University of Chicago. But primarily what I was there to study was the history of science. And that was a degree program. So I actually have a bachelor in the history, philosophy, and social studies of science and medicine from the University of Chicago. So there. Wow, that is very specific. And I did not know this about you, Rob. So interesting fact. All right, well, tell us about the patents that we have and what is our show about today? Because it's a surprise well, for me too. Yes, so today I'm gonna start with a patent from 100 years ago. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to a patent from today that raised somewhat the same issues or or, or uh, provoke the same kind of thought process about our society. Uh, and then I'm going to do that uh, a couple of times, 100 years ago and then today. And I'll signpost a little bit for the audience that um, first, we're going to talk about garments. Second, we're going to talk about hygiene and public health. And third, we're going to talk about control systems, which might sound like the most boring, but please stay to the end because the control system uh, discussion is going to be super interesting. Well, let's turn well, so overview, Rob. So, and I know you did this and we talked about this earlier before the show. So how many people there are on earth versus how many patents are granted each year? Overview, the world's changed, right? We've gone from, I think we were talking about turn of the century patents that you're looking at 1900s. And we were, what are the stats here? I've got some charts that, that you did or that we had uh, Mark do here. Okay, so we've got granted patents and then we've got granted patents per million residents. And then the most interesting chart I thought was granted patents share to US residents versus all patents. So if we take these charts together, what has happened in our world? 
Well, what's happened in our world in, in the last, let's say, 120 years is uh, people have gotten more innovative if you use the ratios that we're putting up on the screen. People in general have gotten more innovative, but the rest of the world has been getting more innovative faster than Americans have. So United States patent application filers have gone down relative to the rest of the world, at least as, as far as U.S. Patent and Trademark Office filings. So you're talking about the owners. So what I found interesting in these stats was that we saw that at the turn of the century, 37,000 patent granted out granted patent applications to U.S. residents, U.S. patents, and about 3,000 granted to foreigners in the U.S. In 2020, we saw 350,000 patents granted to U.S. residents, which is a lot, but 230,000 grant, granted to foreigners or non-U.S. companies. And that's, that's what this graph shows, right? This is a pretty dramatic shift in who's being innovative and where that innovation is coming from in the largest market. So why do you think there's so many foreigners applying for patents in the U.S.? I think developing economies have have just gotten more sophisticated and uh, have decided and realized that it's a great idea to have intellectual property protection. So, Rob, let's let's jump into your patent piece. What, what patent do you want to start with? Well, let's start with the patent. It's 1418371. It's funny we started the conversation talking about foreigners getting patents because, in fact, this is a patent where uh, it was filed in um, 1921 and it issued in 1922 to a woman named Catherine Foster. And, it, and she's listed as a subject of the King of Great Britain and a resident of Rochester in the county of Monroe in the state of New York. So this was a patent, even though the trend has been to, you know, for more foreign residents filing patents now proportionally than 100 years ago. 100 years ago, that was still happening in the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. And I, I also appreciate this as a patent filed by a woman inventor. And you must imagine the challenges that must have faced any woman uh, in the early right. 1920s uh, trying to become an inventor and, and build a business. It's called Money Belt and Su Supporter. And we can see on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. It's basically a girdle with a secret wallet, a secret money pouch. You can buy these on Amazon even today, right? I just went to Europe with my kids and I, I bought a money belt. I didn't use it. I ended up stuffing euros in my pocket and passports were in my wife's purse. But this is something that's pretty common now, this girdle money belt thing. You couldn't patent it today because obviously everything in this vein is pretty obvious. So what are we going to compare this to? Tell me the story here. What's, what's our next patent that we look at? Well, the next patent we're going to look at is from just a couple weeks ago, and this is actually a design patent. Design patents are, are sort of special among the types of patents. The title of this design patent is Male Chastity Apparatus. So uh, trigger alert for everybody. This is going to be a little bit of a, of a PG-rated show for uh, just a couple minutes. So a gentleman named Daniel Berman uh, just received this patent. Uh, on June 14th, 2022. And so what he designed, evidently, was the ornamental appearance of a male chastity apparatus. We're moving from girdles for, for hiding money to, uh, let's say, cages for hiding other valuables. This does not look comfortable or, or actually, I mean, I guess it has to be useful, right? That's one of the requirements to patent something. But um, I mean, how how on earth? I mean, I guess you can get a patent for it, but is this useful? I guess it is. I don't know. Sorry, Rob, I digress. <laughs> well, it, that that raises raises a very important legal point. In order to even apply for a design patent, you have to have an article of manufacture. Uh, so, is it useful? That it, we don't know the answer to that just from the design patents, because because all we know is that the government said it was ornamental. <laughs> I mean, is it ornament? I don't. It's just. A, I mean, it's it's such an interesting. It's an interesting patent, an interesting field. I guess we should start looking for it, looking for this on Amazon, right? Yeah, a male chastity belt. Okay. <laughs> well, if if Mr. Berman got a patent, there's a good chance that he's got a market that he's trying to protect. So Amazon would be a good starting point. Okay. So what is the connection between the money belt from 1900 and 
a hundred, well, 80 years later, no, more than 120 years later. Uh, no, it was 1922. Sorry, my math is horrible. Um, 98 years later, this uh, penis protector. What's what's right. the connection? Um, to me, the connection is ordinary people uh, invent relatively ordinary improvements on objects and, and things that they find around themselves, uh, including clothing, clothing, textiles. Um, there, there's a wealth of innovation going on 100 years ago up to today in the field of clothing, textiles, and coverings. So in one sense, that, that's the category that both of these patents fit in. But it also shows that you know, there's an element of the frivolous that, that you sometimes find in the patent system, uh, not to diminish it because uh, it, it's probably not frivolous to the inventors of these objects and these items, especially if they're trying to protect a marketplace around them. But there's an element of frivolity that you sometimes find in the patent system. And you, you can see some really, really funny inventions from time to time. Okay. And do you, what's the next patent you'd like us to jump to? Well, we're all concerned with public health and, and hygiene. Uh, so I focused on the next patent being from 100 years ago, 1419593. Um, this is going to get a little bit more serious because we're talking about microbes now. So this gentleman, S.H. Thompson, who is a citizen of the United States or was in Los Angeles, California, he devised a new way to make sure that your toothbrush remains sterile. Okay. So tell me a little bit about this, why this invention is relevant for conversation today and how it relates to inventors today. Because well, part time. of your premise here is that pat the patents, we've evolved as a society. And then if you look at the patents at the time, it says something about what's going on in the world. Right. So if you look in the actual figure one of the patent, What's uh, what's rather neat, what I would call the secret sauce of this invention, is that he's got a little bit of an orb at the very bottom of his toothbrush holder. And that orb has an opening on the top. It's actually a, a sort of repository or a tank, if you will, for some kind of sterilizing vapor uh, creating liquid. Maybe it's hydrogen peroxide. I don't exactly recall what it is. But he, he placed, uh, so his invention is to place a sterilizing chemical that is automatically going to vaporize up into the upper chamber and thereby attach to the bristles of the toothbrush and kill the microbes. So what this says to me is that people have always been very concerned, certainly in the last 100, 120 years, uh, with hygiene, public health, avoiding disease, ma maintaining um, the ordinary objects around them in a sterile or clean state so that they don't catch disease. Okay. And what are we comparing it to 100 years later? Well, 100 years later, I, I found uh, a patent from two weeks ago. It's uh, number 11359007, issued Let's to a biopharma corporation. And um, here's, here's a great example of a Chinese inventor. So these particular inventors are from Shanghai, China, and so is the biopharma company. And the title of this patent is Anti-SARS-CoV-2 Neutralizing Antibodies. Anti-SARS-CoV-2 Neutralizing Antibodies. Uh, it is, as you might imagine, it, it's an antiviral antibody. So it reflects our continued obsession or, or interest, in keen interest in maintaining public health, good hygiene, uh, I understand this is not COVID-19 that, that the antibodies are directed to, but a different form of, of COVID or a different um, coronavirus. But nonetheless, it makes us think of COVID-19 and all of the great work that was done, all the innovative work uh, to create antibodies and to create um, various inventions to uh, abate or neutralize the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so we're talking 100 years ago and we're talking now. So if you look at a patent register, I think what you're driving at, and I kind of want to jump into this. If you look at a patent register, you can see, and I will tell you, you know, our, our firm, we, we do what, 1,100 or more patents a year, and they come in waves. And we see it's kind of changes based on what's happening in the world. We'll see a whole bunch of patents for vaping products. 
Now, I know Juul's having a little bit of problems with their vaping world. They've just been banned from every market in the U.S. But um, we'll see a whole bunch of patents for marijuana products or COVID during the COVID pandemic. I, I know we filed not innumerable, but probably at least 100 patents around sanitation and things related to COVID and masks and things like that. So I, I guess you can look at a patent register, what you're saying, Rob, is and see what the concern was or some of the concerns at the time based on the types of patents that are being filed, because these are the leading edge, the new inventions. So today you'd see things like this monoclonal antibody patent or drone patents, whereas 100 years ago you were seeing ways to sterilize a toothbrush or a money belt. That's right. That's right. And so you can see where sort of the line of, of sophistication is stable. Let's say the money belt and the chassis device are about the same level of complexity. But you could see also where the line of sophist sophistication goes way higher. So, for example, right. the sterilization of a toothbrush is certainly important, but it's not nearly as complex as the creation of an antibody. Gotcha. All right. What do you want to jump to next, Rob? Well, I would like to talk about a famous American inventor. He actually spent a good amount of time in Chicago, where I am, and his name okay. is Elmer Ambrose Sperry. And Ambrose Sperry, uh, his name might be familiar to some of the, the listeners right now because the, the name Sperry ended up in the name of many, many companies. And there's a very, very good chance if you ever heard of a, a company name with the, with the name Sperry in it, it all traces back to Elmer Sperry and his innovations. He was something of a polymath, meaning that he was really, really good, really, really skilled at many, many things. He was born in 1860. Uh, he did his, his primary inventive work, let's say after 1880, between 1880, 1930. And what Mr. Sperry is best known as is the father of modern navigation technology. So anytime you're on an airplane that's on autopilot, Anytime you're on a ship that doesn't roll, uh, you're probably benefiting from Mr. Sperry's ideas. So I've got his patent up on the screen. Tell us about this autopilot. I know, having read a little bit about Mr. Sperry, that his patents were used in both World War I and World War II by the U.S. Navy, and that for some reason, he was like revered in Japan as an inventor as well. And I don't quite know the connection there. But tell us a little bit about this patent and what it showed about the times. Because, I mean, right now, to me, as a pilot, somebody who's been flying airplanes for a long time, the first planes that I learned in had a very rudimentary autopilot. And these are planes from the 1990s and the 1980s. And it was probably the result of Mr. Sperry's inventiveness. Now, the planes that we have now on autopilot systems are tied to GPS and they follow GPS. But at base, they're still controlling the air, the surfaces of the aircraft and sometimes even the pitch and speed of the propeller based on his original inventions. That's absolutely right. And he didn't use what would be considered a modern day control system diagram, but modern day understandings of control systems are, are really, really well understood. You think of a box with an arrow coming from below it moving backwards toward the back of the box and then coming back into the box. This is sort of the visual you usually get for a modern day control system where there's an error signal taken from a sensor that gets fed back into the system in a negative feedback loop in order to correct what's starting to become a deviation. So that's a lot of tech speak. But basically, Perry, Perry was a specialist in control systems and his were some of the first. So if we go to the, the figure one of the patent, I'm, I'm really really keen on this diagram. I, I love how it's all spread out. You can see a propeller uh, you can, in the middle. You can see uh, the, what do you call the, the steering wheel of a plane, Tom? A yoke. The yoke. The yoke, my friends. I, 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 I knew you, you would have the answer. And I'm um, not yoking, you, I'm being serious. <laughs> you, and I will not yoke either. But down below, on in the middle, on either side, you see 47 and 47 prime. Those are actually the rudders of, of the airplane. Remember, this is a 1920, actually 1918 vintage airplane that he's sort of flattening out 
in this really stylized view with all of these electrical connections all, all I mean, around. So the Wright brothers, less than a decade before, launched their first plane into the air at Kitty Hawk. And, let, and eight years later, this guy's already invented an autopilot control system for the Wright brothers aircraft. Or he for has the, the progeny of the Wright brothers. He <laughs> has indeed. And the reason why I focused on the rudders is because that, that gives you uh, uh, a sense of what's different between what the Wright brothers did and what, what, what was going on eight years later. Those are very flat planes if you will, that are used to control the direction and turns of, of the airplane, whereas the Wright brothers, uh, it was the first controlled flight that they, that they were able to achieve. But what they were doing, they were actually changing the shape of the wings themselves right. in order to create that directional control. Kind of so, like birds, they were deforming the wings as opposed to actually having mechanical ailerons or rudders. Exactly. And on the so, Wright brothers, it, there's some great historical writings on their patent attorney and how clever and creative he was to write patent claims that relied on that as the embodiment, but then ended up covering the whole industry, even even at dominating Mr. Sperry's inventions. But, so I'm just going to um, pop in as a pilot here, just so our listeners are clear. So the um, the rudders, on the, there is no rudders. There is a single rudder on an aircraft and it controls yaw. And the pedals, there are two pedals on the floor of a modern aircraft that control yaw. And the things on the side on the wings, where they're reforming the wings, are called ailerons. So what we're, I think what we're talking about here are the pedal, either the pedals for the rudder. It, I guess it doesn't really matter because we're just talking about the patents in the context of history. Or we're talking about the um, ailerons themselves. Because usually, I mean, at least in modern aircraft, you've got two rudder pedals for left and right rudder, which is the thing at the back of the plane on the tail, it's upright. And then you've got ailerons, which are the thing on the left wing and the right wing that you control with the yoke. Well, evidently, evidently, uh, as I read this patent, um, there are, instead of ailerons or performing the role of ailerons, there's a separate rudder, in fact. Let's go back to figure one. I want to point out something about Mr. Yeah. Sperry's invention. And, I, and again, down. I'm no expert in 1918 planes. The oldest plane I flew, I think, was from 1962. So, so let's can we get a close up, Tom, of that complex thing in the middle? Looks like two H's next to each other. And and put a highlight over 37, because that's that's going to be very important. This is what he th here's the secret sauce of what Mr. Sperry was doing in this patent. Um, that's a brake. You see little brake pads on the top and on the bottom that clamp down on that center disc. And what his idea was, was to take that, that center disc is actually part of a gyroscope mechanism. And the center disc, when it spins, is helping out with this autopilot functionality. But what Ms. Mr. Sperry decided to do was you need to turn off the autopilot when someone is mechanically steering the plane. So there has to be a system to detect when a mechanical, let's call it steering, I know there's probably a technical term, but when there's a mechanical navigation event happening from the pilot, the all this circuitry needs to know when it's time to stop the autopilot, because otherwise it's going to mess up the mechanical manual navigation. So this these brakes will come down and stop the spinning disc when the right electrical signal is received that there's going to be a mechanical navigation by the, by the pilot. And then conversely, when the pilot lets go of, of the yoke or lets go of whatever is being used to control the rudders, the brakes will lift, the disc will start spinning again, and you're on autopilot all over again. So basically, whenever you, turn, whenever you turn, autopilot goes, on, uh, goes inactive. And conversely, whenever you're not turning, autopilot engages. All right, Rob, so bring this home for me. Now, how does this compare to and contrast with modern inventions? So we're talking about the dawn of aviation in our first 1922 Mr. Sperry patent. And I, I love this Sperry guy now too. You've convinced me. I'm a <laughs> convert. But let's talk contextually about the subject of our show. What's going right. on in 2020 or 2021, 2022? Mr. Sperry, to my mind, was was working on the greatest problems facing society in his day. He was working okay. on 
uh, better air transportation, better sea transportation. He was he was improving so many different things. And he he's sort of a true representative of what we later came to call the greatest generation. His works, his inventions helped us win two world wars, and they were based on developments and improvements in control systems that were really, really smart, really innovative, really um, uh, right for their times as well. So what do I compare that to? I've picked out another control system patent. We're going to fast forward 100 years. What's of greatest okay. concern today uh, in the world of control systems? What are we applying our control system ingenuity to in the modern day? And for that uh, quick, unscientific, uh, random, non-random look, I picked out uh, U.S. patent 11363682. So this is um, what is this? Altria? Is this the vaping? Is this Jewel? This is Jewel. This is this is, I, this is Jewel. Um, this is a patent entitled Aerosol Generating System with Puff Detector. Oh, and gosh. right okay. in the abstract. So everybody, everybody knows what Jewel is. It's vaping. I hear about it from my kids in high school and kids who are vaping illegally or not well i guess now illegally because jules banned but doing it behind the school administration's backs and so this isn't doesn't seem like an innovation that's going to help us win a war um so so compare and contrast this to sperry and what we have going on with jewel and and why you chose this pack the fda said jewel you can't sell your pods or any of your products anymore because you are causing cancer or something like that they're doing something their chemicals are leaching out or something. That's what I've read. Anyway, jump, go ahead and jump in. Not not to not to kill it, kill it, steal your thunder, or kill your thunder. Yeah, the, I think the big picture society issue I see here is that we're we're applying our hard fought understandings of control systems and and we're we're creating all these interesting graphs and doing scientific study in order to um, improve upon what can at best be described as a, a leisure time recreational device. Uh, we're no longer applying control system ingenuity in this, in this view of the world to airplane navigation, uh, to you know, hel helping elevators reach the right, the right floors. Um, we're applying control system technology to vaping. So in particular, this is detecting whether there's a draw on the aerosol generating system in order to improve the delivery or or the efficiency of the vaping device. But Rob, so I think we challenge that supposition. I mean, even today, though, there are certainly hundreds, if not thousands of patents around drones and drone autopilot systems. And I think we have a lawsuit over one right now um, that we're handling uh, involving formation flying for drones. And there are patents around the use of different contacts and attachments to drones. And, we're kind of living in a drone age, if you will, of, of warfare. And that certainly is of interest. So I, I think the evolution has taken different paths. I, and I don't know this for a fact, but I would suspect that in the 1920s, you have the equivalent of Juul. You've got cigarette systems. I don't know what they, maybe cigarette holders. I'd have to guess. I mean, I, I do think we, you and I quickly took a look at the Juul webpage and they proudly list, I think, over 100 patents, U.S. and foreign patents around vaping, like specifically around vaping. So clearly, a lot of our national priorities have changed when it comes to inventiveness. But what does this say about, about the importance of patents and the importance of protecting your market? Well, it's, it's, it's a way to protect investment in a business. It's a way to uh, circle the wagons around an area where you want to plug a lot of money in the hopes of making a profit one day. And I, I think that's the model, the sort of overarching model that Juul and, and Altria were using for sure. So okay. it's a consumer, it's a consumer product model. And and look, I'm not passing judgment on them really. I, I'm I'm just reflecting on what what does this say about society. I think it's 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 a great idea to get a patent if you're about to enter a business and you need to protect your intellectual property. So we've looked at Sperry's navigation control system, and then we've looked at Juul and their and one of their aerosol systems for vaping. Now we've looked at a money belt, and we've looked at a penis protector. I don't know if it's a penis protector. I think it's protecting things from the penis, so maybe 
but we've looked at it, that design path. We all know what it looks like. So we've looked at all of these things and we took a look at some charts showing that the US were innovative, I think by population percentage wise, or by percentage of patents, we're 10 times more patents now than we had back in 1900. And the population's only grown about by three times, right? So the US is very innovative, but then we've seen foreigners getting patents in the US going from 3000 patents as a percentage of granted patents, maybe one tenth of the patents granted back in the 1900s, early 1900s, to today getting almost half or a little bit less than half of all the granted US patents, 232,000 in 2020. So taking all of these inventions and their context and the changes in how people are innovating, what does it say to you or what are your thoughts, Rob Greenspoon, in the study of science and technology about how the world has changed and where we are today and the importance of patents uh, just in any space? Well, look, I'm an optimist and, and the data that I look at to give my optimistic forecast is the increase in the number of patents per person, no matter how you slice it. Um, sure, the US, one could say through one of the charts, the US is falling behind by a ratio that's decreasing. US inventors are decreasing in ratio compared to foreign inventors. But but to me, the real, the real uh, exciting information, the exciting data is the one that, that has the hockey stick up because it shows that we're innovating we're thinking, we're solving problems, all of us around the world. We have in, some intractable problems out there. And I think we need more solutions and we're getting more solutions all the time. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the futurists out there I've read tell you that uh, we do have a lot of intractable problems, apparently, or seemingly intractable uh, in our society and innovation will always help us solve those problems. Awesome. Thanks, Rob, so much for joining us in the Black Letter Podcast. A little bit of an offbeat Black Letter Podcast today. We didn't, we didn't solve the world's business problems, but I think if there's anything you can take away from this, is patent early and patent often. The first to file is the first one to own a patent. Uh, I think if nothing else, Rob, you, you brought home how integrated and integral patents are to every aspect of society from the beginning of the patent system until now and diverse from all kinds of shields and aerosols and airplane control systems, every, even the, the SARS-CoV-19 monoclonal antibody. I don't know if it's monoclonal, it was an antibody. But all of those things are important to society and all of those things are protected by and our system encourages invention in, uh, invention through the patent system. So- Tom, thank you for having me. I thank you listeners and viewers and everybody out there in audio and video land for joining us another episode of the Black Letter Podcast. Download us wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next time on the Black Letter Podcast. Join us in, on our Monday morning minutes every week. Thanks for joining us. That's all for today's episode of Black Letter. Thanks again for listening. Join us next time when we talk about more Black Letter issues in creative ways. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And check out our website at blackletterstudios.com.